So hi, I'm Stephen Forte, and welcome to the Leaders in Tech series, brought to you by the YPO Technology Network. Today, we're speaking with Scott Cooper, managing partner of Andreessen Horowitz, or A16Z as they're known, and author of one of my favorite business books, The Secrets of Sand Hill Road. Welcome, Scott. Thank you. That's a very kind intro. I appreciate it. Well, you know, I wish I had had this book in the, in the 90s when I was pounding the pavement on Sand Hill. I think I would have, you know, had a lot more insight. And I, and I particularly love the way you get into the weeds of the VC business, kind of unusually transparent as both an operator and a VC. So what motivated you to write the book and kind of, uh, you know, go open kimono, as they say, <laughs> at, at Sand Hill Road? Well, it's exactly, I mean, it's the reaction that you had, which is really what I was hoping to get, which was having been in this business for a while, uh, I had thought a lot of these questions had been answered. And, you know, I guess I had a perception maybe that the business was more transparent than certainly it feels to many entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, truth be told, I didn't start writing a book. I started writing some blog posts and, you know, maybe I just felt like I had too much to say, but kind of way led on to way. And then I figured, uh, you know, I may as well just keep writing. Kind of continued then. Well, and, exactly. and for those who are watching, A16Z has a, has a fantastic site as well. You have a lot of video tutorials. You have a lot of information. Certainly great stuff in the book. And I don't necessarily want to rehash all the stuff that you've written about because you go into it with such great detail. But there are a few big topics, say, from the entrepreneurs first you really dig into. And one is this kind of uh, changing landscape for entrepreneurs. What's happening in the seed? Uh, the shift from CapEx to OpEx that's creating this kind of new, wonderful, flat world that has a tremendous opportunity and tremendous competition. Tell me a little bit about that. You have a very unique perspective and set of goggles, seeing the amount of deals that you've seen and this transition over time. Yeah, there's two kind of, I'd say, interesting and in some respects, almost contradictory trends that are happening in the business right now. So one is what you mentioned, which is this idea that access to capital, quite frankly, in any form, whether it's seed capital at the early stage or later stage capital is just, you know, way better than it's ever been. Uh, and so, you know, in the, in the old days, quote, old days of venture capital, you know, capital was a constrained resource and the VCs had it. And that really dynamic has, has really turned on its head. Mm. And so as an entrepreneur, I think what that means is, you know, the ability today to be able to start a business with relatively small amounts of capital and tap into lots of sources of capital to get that money is just, I think, as good as it's ever been. In fact, if you look at seed deals is probably a good measure for this. The number mm -hmm. of deals we're doing today is about eight times what we were doing 10 years ago. So hmm. just in terms of kind of sheer activity at the very early stage level, a lot of it's happening. Um, um, and then the other trend, which is interesting, and again, as I said, in some respects, it's contradictory, is you have companies staying private much longer. And therefore, you know, while it's they're raising small amounts of capital up front, the total capital that people are raising over the life cycle of their right. private times has just dramatically expanded. And this is where you see, of course, people like SoftBank and lots of others coming into the mix. Mm. But, you know, companies are basically staying private for about twice the number of years that they used to kind of now 10 or 12 years versus probably six, six and a half years is what it used to be. And so that's also got big implications for how we think about kind of where wealth accumulates and whether private versus public markets ultimately become the beneficiary of a lot of this growth in the, uh, in the venture ecosystem. Right. You know, and I want to touch on that a bit later, actually, because I'm curious on your perspective, because I think that is one of the challenging sectors we have when we talk about wealth divide and income divide and things that are happening in our society in general. You know, from, from a startup perspective, how valuable are these massive growth of, of accelerators and incubators? Are, do you see that adding a great deal of value to the ecosystem? Is that only useful for the youngest and, and most kind of green entrepreneurs? How do you view those? I think the best value that they add tends to be around network development. And so, you know, let's talk about like Y Combinator, for example, mm -hmm. which is kind of a very successful player in the space. I think probably if you talk to the entrepreneurs who go through that program, what they'll tell you is probably the most valuable thing they get out of it is the cohort and the class of individuals. You know, it's not quite frankly, mm -hmm. unlike what, you know, YPO does, right? I mean, obviously, you know, the way, you know, kind of, I think that organization thinks about, I believe, you right. know, kind of the relationships between CEOs and entrepreneurs is, I think that's really a lot of the benefit that comes out of it. Um, you know, some of them, like Y Combinator, again, who've been successful, also have kind of a positive signaling effect, which is, you know, to downstream investors, uh, as you graduate from Y Combinator, it's a little bit of a stamp of approval, right? Which certainly mm, yeah. implications for how you think about fundraising. So I, I think those are, I think those are the main uh, things people get out of it. You know, the truth of the matter is, with the exception of Y Combinator and a few others, there haven't been as many very successful kind of positive, you know, signaling exercises around incubation. Uh, you know, the vast majority, I think, of funding these days still comes from kind of seed or angel investors that are right. in non-incubator type, uh, type facilities. And that's a different kind of network, obviously. But at least I do think the enduring value probably is having that cohort of people with whom you, you kind of go through the class and mm -hmm. then also have that ability to tap into that network over time. 
You know, so is angel investing still alive with all of these seed funds and the major companies, uh, major VCs, frankly, like Sequoia and others who are creating these incubation funds, seed funds? Um, is there still space for the regular investor to try and get early stage or, or are they better off just kind of finding a great seed fund and just jumping in as a limited? It's a really good question. I think probably the answer is a little bit of both. Uh, there's no question that, you know, kind of that space has gotten very, very crowded. Um, and, and you're right, you've got two things happening, which is you have traditional venture firms, like you mentioned, Sequoia, for example, who are kind of dipping down into, or I guess upstream as the case mm. may be, into the kind of seed space. And then you've had over the last 10 years, a huge proliferation of kind of institutional seed money managers, right? So I think the numbers I saw in the US is something like 800 to 1,000 new firms that have been started in the last 10 years that are all wow. targeting think of it as kind of sub hundred million dollar assets under management fund sizes, right? So there's a lot of capital. So I do think there is still an opportunity for that individual angel investor who wants to, you know, invest some portion of his or her money. But I think the requirement is probably, you, you, in some respects, you might have to even go earlier in the life cycle than perhaps mm -hmm. you had because, you know, what's today a traditional seed round probably is going to have a significant number of institutional investors around it, which might, you know, impact competition. The mm -hmm. other way I think though, maybe to play it as an angel is, if you kind of are just comfortable being part of a syndicate, right? So in other words, right. say, hey, look, yes, we're going to have some other, you know, institutional seed fund write a million dollar check, but there's a series of individuals who might write twenty five, fifty thousand dollar, hundred thousand dollar checks and round it out. Hmm. I think that's an interesting place to play. And if you can be kind of as an angel, non threatening to those players and potentially additive to them from a deal flow perspective, I think right. there's probably you know a desire still to work together. Got it. So the, the, from a VC perspective, does the preferred capital stack still kind of look the same of having this early stage angel investor isn't necessarily look as, I mean, providing they don't have a ton of rights and, and things in their, in, in their agreement, right? From, from yeah. a VC perspective, it's still okay? Yeah, it's definitely still fine. I think, again, what's changed is, you know, what used to be the case was, right, you had kind of individual angels and then you had traditional VC players. There really was not kind of an institutional seed market. Yeah. And so the, the presence of that or the introduction of that over the last, you know, 10, 15 years, it's really changed the competitive dynamic. It's forced people like, you know, you know, people in the early stage market to think about going upstream. And it certainly forced some of the seed players to think about going downstream into the A round market. So there's a little bit of people, I guess the way I describe it is people used to kind of stay in their swim lanes. Right. And they, you know, I would say the kind of lines between, you know, stages has, has gotten incredibly blurred. And, and my suspicion is it will continue to do so over the years. Hmm. You know, and as, as these early stage companies are pulling together, at what stage are you looking for uh, a bit more of controls and governance with the, all the things we've seen with WeWork and other kind of high uh, profile uh, car crashes, you may say? Uh, what are you looking for in the early stage and what sort of structures do you suggest to folks who are just kind of getting something off the ground? Look, I think, we, I think what we'd like to see and where the market is today, you know, probably are not completely, uh, you know, kind of always the same, right? So I, I think... Look, governance is good. Good governance is important at any stage of a company. And, and look, I think most companies, despite the headlines, look, I think most companies aspire to actually have, you know, good governance structures. The biggest thing, though, that's changed in the industry, again, over the last really 10 years is the boards, the board composition has shifted such that, you know, most of the boards are controlled by the common shareholders, which are obviously, the, you know, held largely by the founders and the entrepreneurs themselves. And so you get into these weird situations where if things don't go correctly, uh, these things sometimes bubble up into these big public, uh, mm. you know, shows of force because right. the preferred, the VCs who are sitting there don't have sufficient numbers of board seats or board votes to be able to vote out an mm. incumbent CEO. And so unfortunately, some of these things play out in the public, you know, blogosphere and, uh, you know, the public space instead of the private space. So I do think everyone is trying to relook at governance more generally, but I, I think some of it is a function of this balance of power that exists between VCs and entrepreneurs. And, you know, we're at a stage now where, for many entrepreneurs, they can kind of command control of the board, which again, really then kind of changes the nature of that uh, relationship for sure. Right. You know, so from a board perspective, you know, we have a lot of members who serve on boards, public and private. Give me an example of some of the things you've had to work through, and maybe you don't have to name names, but <laughs> challenges you've been able to solve it as a board member in, in kind of either re-steering a company or doing uh, you know, obviously replacing the CEO is, is, has always been one of those, but I guess short of that, what, what sort of the levers have you been able to pull as a board member to change direction or influence in one of your investments? Yeah, so I think importantly, um, you know, I think what we need, what we try to recognize, and, and I'm sure many of your members do as well, is 
what we can do effectively as a board member and what we can't do. And so, you know, to me, like, you know, one of the first rules of a board member is making sure that you don't actually overstate uh, your understanding and knowledge of the intricacies of the business and therefore wreak havoc or create confusion, quite frankly, for the CEO or the executive team, as I'm sure you've, you've seen that on some of your boards. But look, there's on the far end, obviously, replacing a CEO, which we've, we've obviously had to do that sometimes. And that's sometimes, sometimes actually not as, as bad of an experience as you might expect. Sure. I mean, there, I would say there are certainly more cases of the good kind and the bad kind where, you know, the CEO really has come to the realization that he or she just may not be ready to kind of take the company to the next level of growth. And, and we've had some very nice transitions there. We had a, uh, we have a company in our portfolio, PagerDuty, that's now a public company. Uh, where uh, Jen Tejada uh, came in. We brought her in as kind of the second CEO. She took over from the founder and the founder, Alex, has stayed in the company and he's the CTO and their working relationship is fantastic. And so those things are nice when that happens, which is you can kind of keep the founder still heavily engaged in the business, but then be able to bring somebody in from the outside who can help. You know, I think the stuff that that goes under the radar a lot is um, thinking about kind of what I would call um, trying to use your sphere of influence around uh, financing activities and around you know, cash consumption and kind of milestones in the business. So I'd say most of what we tend to do is to try to give the CEO a realistic assessment of, okay, this is how much cash you have left. These right. are the milestones that are going to be expected of you if you want to go raise capital, hopefully at mm -hmm. an evaluation that's higher than the last right. round of financing and trying to work through that. In fact, I'm going through one right now where we've got a company that is, you know, on the top line of doing very well, but their expense numbers just are out of line for the stage of company where I think a new investor would be comfortable coming in. And so a lot of what we're trying to work with them behind the scenes on is look, how can we, you know, even if we have to take a little bit of a few points off that top line growth, right. can we cost structure in line so that you will be attractive to that next round investor? So I think those tend to be the most places. And then I'd say the third area is since many of our CEOs are, you know, lesser experienced than you and probably some of your members, um, things around organizational development tend to be another big area where we spend time on mm -hmm. is, you know, many of these CEOs, uh, you know, they've never hired a CFO before, a VP of sales. And so sometimes you've got kind of, you know, organizational inertia that makes it hard to bring in executives in some of these companies. Right. Other times you just have a CEO who just doesn't know what success looks like in that role. And therefore mm -hmm. either, you know, consciously or unconsciously, they're uncomfortable bringing on that role because, you know, they don't know how to manage a CFO or they don't know, do I want a control oriented CFO versus an FBA oriented CFO? And so a lot of what we try to do is kind of help behind the scenes and at least provide some guidance and structure around organizational development. Hmm, totally makes sense. And is it still kind of top line at all costs in Silicon Valley where that growth matters over everything? Or is there a sharper eye now on something actually making money? I, I think certainly the pendulum has swung a little bit. Uh, uh, look, growth is still important at the end of the day, right? I mean, we are growth investors. And the reason why these companies obviously, you know, can achieve, you know, scale and, and get into new markets and hopefully, you know, be, be paid for that is going to be a function of growth. But there's no question if you look at kind of, you know, as companies make that transition from the private markets to the public markets, we've got to be mindful of how the public markets value these companies. And fundamentally, you know, as you would suspect, look, the, the, the fundamental economics of the business matter. And so, you know, look, it's one thing if you've got, let's take a traditional software company where we know at scale, it's going to have 80 plus percent gross margins. Right. You know that at scale, again, you ought to be able to get it to, you know, 20, 30 or, you know, even higher points of operating margin. You know, if you have a rational story for why you're, you know, spending 50% of, of your revenue on, on sales and marketing because you think the growth makes sense, you know, that's, that's easier for people to digest. I think what's harder is where you have not just new technologies, but new business model innovations where, you know, kind of the, the long-term models are still on the come, right? People just don't know exactly what the long-term models will be for some of these other non-traditional kind of enterprise software businesses. And right. so that's, there's no question the market is taking a closer look at those things. And look, we've got to adjust to that in the venture space as well, because, you know, we are ultimately a consumer of the public markets at some point in time. Yeah. No, absolutely. You know, there's a lot of YPOs, maybe almost a third that are in some generational approach running a family business. What opportunity do they have to either break out, do a new startup, compete, maybe within that ecosystem, trying to keep a family business that might be, you know, frankly, a legacy business, maybe 10 car dealerships in the Midwest to something alive. Do you see much of that from an investment perspective or, or how can they play? Yeah, I don't see, we don't see as much directly on the entrepreneur side, mostly that's just self-selection on our part, which is we tend to be looking for things that are more, you know, where software or technology is the underpinning of the business as opposed to, you know, potentially some more traditional industries. Where I see, though, a lot of families like that playing is in two areas. One is many of them kind of are limited partners in venture firms. 
partly potentially for financial return, but partly also from an educational perspective, which is uh, they want to understand kind of are there facets of technology that might ultimately impact their uh, core businesses. I was actually on a call with a, uh, a big family office uh, outside the U.S. who runs a bunch of um, uh, industrial, uh, industrial companies. Mm. And that's their primary motivation is, look, obviously they're trying to you know, generate returns on their, on their financial investment as well. But the main thing they want is how can we get a window into what's happening in the technology world in a way that those things might impact our, you know, our, our core source of you know, financial wealth these days. And so I see more of that than I do mm. than necessarily kind of uh, you know, coming to us on the entrepreneur side. Sure. And, and let's talk about that, the limited side. So the folks out there in, in, in our network and YPO that are looking to get involved in exposure, maybe they don't have the time or the skill to be an angel investor and get involved. How do they look at approaching either personally or part of their family office to becoming a limited in Dreesen or, or any firm for that matter? What should they be thinking about? What should they look at? Yeah. So I would say, first of all, in terms of the opportunity, like most firms like us have predominantly what I would consider large institutional limited partners, right? So foundations, endowments, you mm -hmm. know, corporate pension type money. But, you know, we do have, uh, we have some kind of larger family offices. And then, you know, we will also, we tend to run what we call some side funds, which are kind of just, they invest pro rata alongside our main funds okay. that tend to comprise of people who are, you know, just, you know, obviously, you know, uh, individuals with enough financial resources to do this. So those could be you know, half a million or a million dollar investments as opposed mm -hmm. to an institution who might be writing a 30 or 50 or $100 million check. Um, look, I think the opportunity set is great right now uh, in part because of this, what we talked about earlier, which is this transition of companies staying private longer and therefore more and more wealth accretion happening in the private market. So I think there's definitely lots of opportunities, you know, kind of more broadly in the private markets. And, and look, I'm not making any uh, these are, I'm not making a financial recommendation or any endorsement here, but, but if you look broadly at the trends that have been happening in the industry for kind of the last 10 to 15 years, it is the case demonstrably that because companies are staying private longer, that more of the appreciation of these companies is accruing to various private market investors. And so I think that's the potential opportunity for a family office as part of a you know, broader diversified portfolio is to have some view from an asset allocation perspective as to how do you think about kind of relative strength of public versus private investments over a long horizon. And, you know, if you're up for the risk appetite, you know, of a, of a venture portfolio, uh, there's certainly some interesting opportunities today. Hmm. You know, and I'd love to get your perspective on things. And, and what I really like is your, the, the goggles and lens that you have is very unusual, at least for our group compared to most. Most of us are wrapped into operating businesses. We run from day to day. We don't necessarily see the breadth or just the volume of what's happening in this world. So, Insights. You're kind of an aggregator of what's happening in tech. What is going on? What are some of the trends you're seeing? Obviously, AI and, and you know cloud and edge computing is coming in, which is going to be fueled by 5G. There's there's a lot of these transitions that I think are actually intersecting at the same time, which is going to make 2020 is a really interesting decade, I believe, in tech. What's really top of your radar? Yeah. So we uh, we invest across one theme, which is called Software is Eating the World, that my partner Mark Andreessen wrote about uh, almost a decade ago now. And what that means for us is we view software as a horizontal technology that we think can permeate, lot, permeate lots of different vertical industries over time. And quite frankly, the way we view our job is we're kind of in the talent business, which is we need to kind of identify all the talent who's doing something breakthrough in software. And then we need to go learn the vertical markets they're applying that to and figure out, does that intersection actually make for a reasonable business opportunity? So uh, the, the short answer to your question is that's an incredibly broad mandate. Um, and so, you know, we are doing stuff everywhere from, you know, consumer facing technologies like an Instacart or an Airbnb to enterprise technologies. I mentioned this company, company PagerDuty, which is an IT operations company. Uh, we've got a public company today, Okta, which is in the kind of security and single sign-on space. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and the big growth areas that we're spending a lot of time on are probably, I'd say, there are three big areas where uh, over the last five years or so, we've been investing and increasing our resources. Number one is kind of financial services broadly. Mm -hmm. uh, and so everything from you know, kind of where, where this industry started probably 10 years ago, the fintech industry around new consumer lending models. But now there are people doing interesting things in the real estate industry. Uh, you know, we're an investor in a company called Open Door that some of your colleagues may know. And that's kind of trying to change the way people buy and sell homes in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, there are new kind of insurance models where people are trying to take social media activity and other inputs to effectively almost build a new FICO score uh, and a new kind of health you know, health index score to think about how do you insure people on the life insurance side or on the health insurance side. Um, so there's a lot of stuff happening in fintech and that's a big growth area for us. Um, 
The second area is we spend a lot of time today at the intersection of computer science and life sciences. Right. So one of the things to us that's really interesting is, you know, we've had this obviously tremendously long, you know, boon over a 40 or 50 year period of kind of computers and technology inputs, of course, you know, continuing to drop in price while performance, you know, continues to, to grow at a very high rate. We're now starting to see that in the, you know, life sciences sector where, you know, the cost of obviously things like sequencing genomes and other stuff has come down tremendously. And a whole new generation of biologists kind of grew up basically programming computers. And so kind of bringing those two disciplines together, uh, you know, you mentioned AI, for example. So there are companies that are using elements of artificial intelligence to try to kind of improve what has been a pure scientific discovery and trial and error process and try to make it a more applicable process where computers can do the things they're good at, like, you know, crunch large sets of data or, you know, uh, do use visual recognition, right, to identify, you know, radiology, uh, you know, uh, you know, pictures and things of that sort. So that's a big area for us. Uh, and then a third area that is very, very new and kind of out on the frontier is we are doing a decent amount of investing around crypto related technologies. So our fundamental thesis there is we think of crypto as really a new way to build a, a new platform uh, for development where that platform is decentralized instead mm -hmm. of centralized, obviously, is, and it's, you know, it's, it's, very, it, it's actually very interesting and not surprising to us that at the same time you have a lot of this antitrust activity, you know, kind of being talked about in BC right. that you have kind of the rise of, you know, to us what looks like a little bit of a free market, you know, antidote to some of the concerns that people have around concentration. So those are some of the big areas we're, we're focused on right now. Oh, interesting. You know, and, and sometimes I know government gets in the way of this stuff. I know you've done a bit of work in terms of lobbying yeah. in D.C. You know, it's been encouraging to see, I think, some of the new uh, announcements from the FCC about opening bandwidth and spectrum and competition for 5G so we can once again, or once, should I say, for the first time, become competitive, frankly, globally. Uh, uh, you know, as, as well as the Jobs Act and that opening up some opportunities for funding. So we're starting to see government uh, slightly get out of the way a bit. You, you think we're heading in the right direction um, from a policy perspective? You know, it's it's hard to know because I think you're right. I think there are there. I think it's it's very uh, bipolar in some respects, which is you're exactly right. Which is the FCC rules, Jobs Act is very positive. Uh, you know, we have a commissioner in the SEC who, in general, is trying to kind of you know make it easier for companies to go public and, and you know lessen some of the regulatory burdens there. Um, and then look, I would say on the other side, you've got you know things like uh, obviously you know China, of course, is not just in the news today for you know, kind of the, uh, the uh, health issues that are happening there, but just the general competitiveness, of course, and yeah. introduction, you know, we, we've kind of obviously tightened capital controls with China. We've, we've tightened up, you know, uh, immigration obviously has been a big area. So I think there's, I think on the one hand, there's reason to believe that, you know, kind of we're, we're more progressive in some of these things. On the other hand, I think, uh, particularly as it relates to some of the inputs of technology, which are capital flows and ultimately, you know, human capital resources, it's, it's harder these days to execute on some of those and certainly it was. And then of course you've got, you know, the broader, there's the broader discussion just generally obviously about, you know, appropriately. So, you know, what's the role of technology? How do we deal with privacy? How do we deal with other things like that? So, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to read the tea leaves on this stuff, but, um, and we'll know a lot more obviously come November yeah. probably as to how the tea leaves will actually Very turn true. out. Uh, but I think there's, I think there's puts and takes on both sides just to be fair in terms of how we see it right now. You know, as investors, how do you focus on this whole kind of Darwinian nature of many of these platform spaces, right? So, so we don't have 14 WhatsApps on our phone and 27 Facebooks. There's kind of one who takes all. Do those markets attract you or repel you that there's likely only to be one winner and not multiple successful players? Yeah, this is really, I mean, this truly is really the history of technology companies more generally, uh, which is it tends to be that these are generally winner-take-all or winner-take-most markets. Mm -hmm. And the difference between being number one in a market and being number two or three in a market or below that is very, very significant. And it makes sense in particular when you think about technology, right? Because, you know, if you think about if you're the leader in the market, how much additional gross margin and how much additional capital you can afford to put back into R&D and really sure. kind of create a flywheel of, you know, kind of, you know, buffering your intellectual property, uh, you know, around, around competitors. So, so we, we know that. And look, as investors... We like that. The way we mitigate that risk as investors is, of course, we manage a portfolio. And we know within that portfolio, for better or worse, that there's going to be a small number of companies that are ultimately going to drive most of the returns. And so if we're lucky enough to get a Facebook or a Google or, you know, an Apple or an Amazon or something like that in your portfolio, you know, it makes up obviously for, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the companies in your portfolio that just won't work. And so, you know, this is why I think, you know, to go back to your point earlier about individual angels and, and you know, kind of individual uh, high net worth individuals investing, 
I think the danger in this market is to think you can rifle shoot uh, and kind of, you know, pick off the one or two best companies uh, that ultimately might become those great businesses. Because, look, I can tell you, you know, we've been in this business for 11 years now, and there's obviously lots of people who've been in this business for 40 or 50 years. Um, this concept of a power law really plays out, which is, you know, it is the case in our business that a very small number of companies will deliver 80, 90% of the returns. And so if you don't have that risk mitigation of a portfolio, uh, you might you might get it right and you might end up being the best venture capitalist in the world. But I would say the chances of doing so are probably pretty slim. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, on the exit side, you know, you, you've spoken a bit and we, we know this, there's fewer public entities being traded today than there were 10 years ago and beyond. Yeah. So uh, whether that's Sarbanes-Oxley or controls or, or just the, the way the private markets have changed and consumed so much wealth, uh, I, I guess beyond that, because I know there's a lot of sound bites on what's happening there, what do you think is the solution for getting access to this private opportunity in private markets so, so we don't continue to have this kind of wealth divide that you're seeing to where folks who, who again, have all of their investments riding in the stock market may get a lesser return than you're gonna see from some of the most successful companies. Is yeah. there a solution to that or what's your perspective? Uh, I, I think so and I would say the nature of how we go about that solution, and at least in my mind, has developed a little bit over the last you know, couple of years. So my, my first instinct on this was, look, could we solve the problem from the public company side? In other words, could we figure out what is it to your point that is causing companies to stay private longer, to not want to be public companies earlier in their life cycle? And could we address changes in the capital market structure to deal with that? And, and I, you know, I had the pleasure of being able to spend some time with the SEC and, and members of Congress on this. Um, I'm increasingly, uh, you know, kind of, I would say, I'm more pessimistic on that as the solution uh, mm. because the, I think the hard problem we have to solve is, can you make it attractive to be a smaller cap public company these days? And for better or worse, whether it's Sarbanes-Oxley or whether it's market structure or whether it's just fundamental economics, yeah. it's a very lonely place to be as a small cap company because you don't have the same research and investment banking infrastructure you used to have to cover that segment of the market. You don't have you know, so many institutional investors and the rise of indexing and everything else, of course. All of those things tend to favor very highly liquid large cap stocks. And mm. so there may still be a few things I think at the margin we can do, but I think increasingly that's a more challenging problem. I think the better solution, and actually I think you may have seen this, the SEC put out a release probably about a month or two ago, is can we liberalize the private markets in a way that we can make them more accessible and also safe? Because I also want to be careful about, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is that, you know, kind of public markets and private markets are very different in terms of information disclosure and, and right. risks. But could we do things to liberalize the rules by looking at the accredited investor definitions or... Mm -hmm making it easier potentially for people to be part of pooled vehicles, which again, hopefully mitigate some risk. And my, my own view is I think over the next, hopefully 10 years, maybe five years, um, I think we will see a more liquid kind of public, uh, excuse me, private secondary market. Uh, and it won't quite look like a fully tradable NASDAQ, and it, but it won't look like the kind of bespoke deals we do today. It'll be somewhere right. in between, I think. It'll have some SEC regulation. And hopefully that's a way to kind of liberalize access to some of the appreciation that we've been talking about. Hmm. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if we're able to kind of do that. You know, yeah. and, and so you've had a broad portfolio of companies you were mentioning earlier, the sectors you're in, which is obviously extremely broad. Yeah. There has to be certain segments of those that you find commonality with success. Are, are there any, I mean, obviously you picked a great entrepreneur, tenacity, the ability to pivot. I mean, these kinds of things. Is there anything in particular you find that, all of these successful ones have in, have in common. I assume timing is always one. But <laughs> is there anything else that's a bit more selectable, you think? Because you don't always know if you have just the right timing, right? Uh, it's very hard. Uh, but I think, so the way you think about timing, though, is uh, can you think about, is there some inflection point or some kind of, uh, let me say it the other way, which is we often ask the question, why now, right? So yeah. why, why should this company exist now? And so the timing question to us, you're right, we don't always get it right. And probably one of the biggest risks in this business is getting the trend right, but getting the timing of adopting that trend wrong. Right. But so that's why we try to force ourselves to think about that why now question, which is what exists today that didn't exist? Is there some inflection point in the industry which you know suggests that something that might not have been doable before is doable now? I think that's an important way to kind of try to minimize timing risk. And again, we won't get it right all the time. You know, the other big thing, I mean, it's implicit in everything you said, but look, we are fundamentally looking for you know, markets that are big enough to be able to sustain very large, standalone, profitable, you know, kind of public companies ultimately. And so, you know, 
a big dividing line between what a venture capitalist typically will do versus won't do is, you know, is the market opportunity big enough to be able to sustain a big company? And, and that's not because we're necessarily bigots about big companies, but just that, right. again, if you look at the portfolio, the way, it's got, the way our business will work is we will be wrong more times than we're right. And it's what matters is the magnitude of when we're right ultimately. And so that lends itself to, to big markets. Um, and then the, the third thing we tend to try to look at is, uh, you know, there's kind of two facets of innovation and sometimes they are in cooperation with one another. One is kind of, is there fundamental technological innovation that we think can create therefore a long-term, you know, competitive moat for the business and make it sustainable with, you know, high profit margins and high cash flow generation. And then the other is kind of, you know, you know, a lot more of what we see these days is what I consider kind of new business model innovation. So, hmm. you know, you could argue if you look at a lot of the enterprise SaaS companies, the software as a service companies today, you know, there's nothing necessarily foundational from an intellectual property perspective that many of these companies are doing. Uh, you know, right. uh, there's, you know, they're, they're doing great things and I don't want to minimize it, but, you know, they're not inventing, you know, new drugs. They're not, you know, kind of inventing some new patented interesting, you know, way to develop software, but a lot of them have figured out innovative business models and ways to go to market and ways to attract customers with lower cost and, you know, built in, you know, models that have, you know, upsell and, and customer stickiness attached to them. So those are the things we're trying to figure out. Um, you know, uh, ultimately there's a big debate in the industry as to like, if you had to pick one team versus market, what would you pick? Uh, and I think you'll probably find people different things. Um, there are definitely, uh, you know, the um, Don Valentine, who was, a, you know, kind of one of the founding partners of Sequoia, very famously has always stuck to, you know, he's like, look, I don't, you know, I, I only look at markets basically because like if the market is good and big enough, uh, you know, I can kind of get any team to run it. It's a little bit like uh, Warren Buffett's kind of, you know, ham right. sandwich comment, right? Which is, you know, you, you like businesses that can be run by a ham sandwich. And, you know, I would say, you know, we don't certainly, I wouldn't say we completely disagree with that, but I think we do have a big faith in, in teams and the ability of entrepreneurs to ultimately, you know, think about product differentiation, think about product breakthroughs and ultimately build a team and be successful. So, you know, we're probably more in the middle of, you know, that those two things are, you know, equally important in many respects. Hmm. So, you know, you're on your second glass of wine in the evening and reflecting as you look at the sunset. Uh, what do you think about? What bothers you? And I don't necessarily mean within your day-to-day -day business, right? You're, you're skilled enough in the investment and operating side. I don't think that's the kind of stuff that may haunt you. But what do you worry about for your kid's future when you look at the economy, where it's going, whether it's wealth divide, whether it's information divide? What kind of things scroll through your head, with the, again, with the particular lens you have, which you, know, you, you see many different things that we don't in terms of deal structure, flow, trends? What, 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 what freaks you out? <laughs> yeah, I've got I've got three daughters uh, at various stages of their lives, and so look, I worry about um, I do worry about income inequality. Um, uh, in that, look, we we've been massive beneficiaries of technology as of many of your your members, uh, but it's still the case today that you know if you live on you know if you live in New York or Boston or if you live in San Francisco or L.A. or other place other major metropolitan cities you know, you, your, your quality of living and your quality of life has been universally better by, you know, through technology. And, and that's reflected, obviously, in growing wealth inequality. It's just, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that is what it is. Um, what I worry about is, though, that, you know, we just, we haven't figured out a way to actually incubate and develop technologies outside of those regions in a way that's repeatable and that can actually broaden the base for, uh, for the U.S. So if you look at venture capital dollars in the U.S., 70% of the dollars are basically San Francisco, Boston, New York, if you add LA, that gets you to 80%. Um, and that, that just shouldn't be the case. And I'm, I'm an optimist. And so I believe that won't be the case over the next 20 years. But I think for technology to continue to grow and for us to also have a civil society where, you know, kind of people don't feel like there are always kind of, you know, huge divides between haves and have nots. I think we've got to figure out a way to liberalize funding um, across the U.S. Um, and so I worry about that. The other thing I worry about is I'm not an AI um, nihilist, I don't know what the right word would be in the sense that, look, you know, as you know, through almost all technology revolutions and, and changes over time, you know, economy has, economies have grown, quality of life has gotten better for everybody, jobs yeah. that disappeared have been replaced with, with new jobs that we didn't know right. about. So I still believe that is all true. I do worry that uh, the pace of technology is so fast that we now have kind of intra-generational change as opposed to intergenerational change. Um, and so, you know, a simple example, which people talk about all the time, but I think is a great example is, you know, truck driving is the number one job in, I think, every single state in the United States. Right. You know, it's hard. In to, retail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And it's hard to imagine, you know, over a, you know, at least a 10 year period that there won't be material job dislocation that mm -hmm. comes from things like autonomous driving, which, 
you know, in the long run probably will be a positive thing in terms of creating new opportunities and jobs, but we've never had technology uh, proceed at such a pace where you have these kind of intergenerational transitions. And so I just worry as a country that we haven't dealt with that at all and we don't have any plans yet to deal with it. And, mm. you know, it's, I don't know whether it's retraining, I don't know what it is to be completely honest. So I'm not necessarily blaming politicians for it, but uh, it feels like it's a common conversation to me that's more imminent than I think people, you know, uh, realize. And, and I'm, I'm concerned that we're not addressing it. We've never been so good at the long view here, at least in America, I think. Yeah. And, and we, we've stumbled into all of our industrial revolutions that way. And, and very much, I guess, as we never would have considered the job of a social media manager even 10 years ago, that right. that, that creates these aspects, which is frankly good. I have a 22-year-old daughter as well. So it's a good thing that there's these new fields where they could be a guru at 25 and there's not someone else who, who's owned the market forever, which I think is always interesting. You know, how much are you seeing distributed work make an impact? In the old days, I know if you didn't have all of your engineers sitting at a seat in Silicon Valley, that just it truly didn't have the value that they felt from an acquisition perspective. But now I think it's becoming, at least from my perspective, a bit more acceptable for people that have team around the world. Yeah. Are you, are you seeing the same thing from an investment perspective or is there still kind of the myopic goggles of the team needs to be here in Palo Alto? Yeah, I think there's definitely, uh, I, think, I think the market is moving consistent with what you described, which is, I still think at the, at the very early stages, we still do tend to see consolidated engineering teams, you know, and, and, you know, early stages call it, I don't know, first, maybe 30, maybe as much as 50 engineers. And that's not universally true, but I'd say, I think people still feel like there is value in concentration of location at that stage. Mm -hmm. But there's no question that kind of, you know, once you get beyond that, the acceptability and obviously look, as the technology gets better, you know, we're doing this on a Zoom call, right? All these things get so much easier. And so, yes, we are seeing more decentralization. I think you'll continue to see it. Uh, the things that help are when you have big companies like a Facebook or Google who then decide to open offices in New York or uh, I was in, you know, uh, you know, uh, Austin the other day, you know, Facebook has, has big presence there. And so mm. once you can do that, then you create a critical mass. So, you know, you kind of create a locus of engineers who then ultimately kind of spawn out and go do other things. And so I think that is happening. It will continue to happen. You know, we still see, I would say, probably less international uh, distribution. Uh, it's very specific to some companies. Like we, as I mentioned, we do crypto related stuff. Crypto tends mm. to have maybe just by nature of the uh, the crypto industry itself, because people talk about decentralization, decentralization of teams right. also is a yeah. feature of those uh, projects. But in the, in, you know, in the more, in the non-crypto stuff, I would say still international penetration still isn't that great for most companies. And more of them still think about it as a quasi outsourced model, which is okay. You know, let's have some, you know, let's go open an office in Eastern Europe where we are mm -hmm. kind of somewhat arbitraging costs to it, you know, or, you know, it used to be China now it's other places in Southeast Asia. And so, that, that, that exists today, but I would say it's less commonplace than, quite frankly, you might expect. Hmm. Yeah, I'm starting to see that increase. Certainly uh, within YPO, I know so many companies are heading that direction, not just cost savings, but uh, inefficiency of intelligence, I know, because even for some things I've done in my tech world, the ability to find an expert somewhere around the world and float a particular problem amongst three different people with three different perspectives where in my old tech days, I had an army of engineers. If they were all certain, say, C++ programmers, the, all the solutions came back in C++. So. <laughs> Shock, shockingly, that's what happens. Right? Yeah, well, it wasn't a lot of variability. So anything else you see on the horizon within the VC world changing, you think, over the next few years, or you think it's going to still be kind of more like the, the oil tanker that's changing, but, but drifting ever so slowly toward the new direction? No, I think it's going to keep changing. And look, these, these last 10 years have been a real big sea change in the industry. So I think what's going to happen is, you know, I mentioned this concept of swim lanes. I think the, the idea of swim lanes is going to largely disappear. I think people are going to think of themselves as, look, I am primarily a private technology investor. And I think you will continue to see people bridging between upstream, what today is upstream and, and downstream investment opportunities. Uh, I think you'll continue to see more dollars of people who, you know, might otherwise have put money in the public markets, look at these later private markets. We already see, you know, a whole new set of entrants, right? There are private equity guys who are doing, you know, I wouldn't call it VC work, but later stage venture funded yeah. companies, right? There are sovereign wealth funds that are doing this. So I think that's going to continue to change. I think the, the availability of capital, I don't see anything that suggests availability of capital is going to be constrained uh, anytime in the near term. Now, who knows, obviously, from a macro perspective, what might happen, but at least it, it, all the trends seem to suggest capital availability being, you know, kind of very, very, you know, open and, and, and readily available. 
Uh, and then, as I said, I think the other big thing to watch in my mind will be kind of this quasi-public, quasi-private secondary mm -hmm. market uh, and what implications that has for you know, both exits for early stage VCs as well as for opportunities for a broader set of investors to participate in the appreciation. You know, and what's your perspective on the markets the way they are today? I mean, look, I'm no public equities expert, but it looks to me a bit like a crowded trade. All the things I learned about valuation analysis in terms of multiples seem to have just flown out the window. We're still hitting highs in the stock market. And do you think that's, that's valid? Do you think it's warranted? Do you think it's just the trend? There's nowhere else to put people's money. Kind of what's your general perspective on the market? Yeah, so look, I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a public stock market analyst either, but it's always fun to prognosticate on these things. Um, look, I, uh, uh, you know, look, I'm an optimist. I think you have to be an optimist to be in this business. And you're absolutely right, which is to look on, on any relative basis, uh, things are, you know, uh, things are, you know, more highly valued today, certainly than they've been over the last 10 years. I don't think there's any question about that. What I try and look at is in the world that we focus in, which is technology, is do I believe that technology's contribution to overall GDP and overall economic growth is, is growing at a rate that is consistent with what I think it is and are valuations generally in line with that? So, for example, um, you know, we don't have the time to do this today, but, you know, I look at things like what's the amount of venture capital investing relative to, you know, GDP or what's the S&P IT index relative to the S&P 500 index? And if you look at most of those numbers, I think what you'll find in general is you know, we had this incredible, you know, peak and trough in 98, 99, and then 2000, right? So the right. Bubble, is, bubble is easily found and easily pronounced in all those metrics. So there's no argument on that. What you'll find, though, generally after that is, of course, we had this major, you know, fall, you know, in the early 2000s. And then we've generally been on what I would say, a, it's not completely linear, but a fairly linear growth curve over that time period. And uh, that's not to say that lines always go up and to the right, but that at least as I read the data today, it feels to me like what is happening is the valuation is reflecting the increasing prominence and importance of technology in our markets. And, you know, I will get more worried personally as an investor if I start to see that valuations and or capital invested are far ahead of what I think the actual contribution of the economy is. And at least by my read, I don't think we're there yet. So, you know, uh, that's, that's, you know, again, for you, you, get, you, you paid, you know, you, that advice is worth basically what you paid for it. But, uh, uh, that's at least how that's at least how I try to think about where the trends are in the business. No, it makes sense. I'd love to hear perspectives and on everyone's different angle on what they see. And, and elections go one way or another here in in 2020, and Google's get broken into a bunch of little Googlets. Does that change technology the way you see it in big tech? What what sort of impact does that make? I think it does make an impact globally, obviously, because then it's harder to compete with companies that are state sponsored, like in China. But what what do you think that means here? Yeah. I mean, look, honestly, I have, to, I honestly have no idea, uh, to be frank. I mean, I think, look, I, you know, the, the idea that, so in general, at least government regulation has tended to actually favor incumbents rather than accomplish many of the objectives of trying to encourage entrepreneurship. And what I try to be focused on is, look, what are the things that we can do as a voice for the industry to try and make sure that the U.S. continues to be the most attractive place for great entrepreneurs in places like YPO, to be able to start businesses and grow businesses. And so to me, that means, you know, free flow of people. It means free flow of capital. It means, you know, not no regulation, but a regulatory environment that actually you know, kind of recognizes that the markets in general are pretty efficient and that venture capital dollars are a good way to kind of, you know, weed out, you know, the kind of success and, and the, the kind of ideas that may not make it. And so, you know, that's what I'm trying to do is to kind of, you know, be that, you know, represent that voice in DC. But uh, look, I'm not. A, I'm definitely not a politician, so I have no idea how that will come out. And uh, you know, your bet is is definitely as good as mine for sure. Fantastic. Well, look, I, I so appreciate you joining us here today. I thought the insights are absolutely fantastic, and I hope we can invite you and have you out at one of our YPO events around the world soon. I would love to do it, and I appreciate you taking the time. Thanks. Thanks. 